The committee will, will come to order. We're now here to recognize the second panel of witnesses. Um, we're very pleased to welcome uh, Ms. Josephine Terry. She is the mother of the late Border Patrol agent Brian Terry. And Ms. Terry, on behalf of all of us, both sides of the aisle, we thank you for your son's service and we, God bless you. Thank you for being here and, and talking about a very difficult subject and uh, appreciate your bravery and your, your being here today. I'm sure this is not something in your life that you ever uh, thought or chose to do, but we're, we're honored and privileged to, to hear from you and, and want to hear your full story. Uh, we also have Mr. Robert Heyer. He's the Terry family spokesman. He's also the cousin of late Border Patrol agent uh, Brian Terry and Mr. Heyer. We again um, saddened for the loss in the Terry family, and but appreciate your, your willingness and uh, ability to come here and share a perspective from the family, which we should never, ever forget. We thank you for being here. We also have uh, Mr. John Dodson. He was a special agent at Phoenix Field Division, Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives. And if you listen to this gentleman's story and what he has gone through, somebody who's serving his country as patriotically as he possibly can, it is absolutely horrific. And um, sir, we thank you for your service and everything that you've gone through. I, we appreciate your candidness. Uh, answering questions to the committee throughout the process, uh, but we look forward to your public testimony. And again, thank you for your your commitment to the United States of America and your willingness to come here and share your story with us as well. Uh, pursu pursuant to committee rules, all witnesses are to be sworn before they testify. So if you please, now that you've settled in, go ahead and stand back up and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Thank you. Let the uh, record reflect that all witnesses answered in the affirmative. Um, in order to allow time for discussion, we would appreciate it if you would limit your verbal comments to five minutes. We'll give you a little bit of lead, lead time, or leeway, but uh, if you could limit that. Your entire written statement, uh, as you have submitted, as the committee members already have, uh, will be entered into the record. Um, you're going to need to pull those microphones nice, tight, and close to your to your mouth, and then you just make sure you hit that talk button. Uh, there are lights there that will indicate, as uh, Mr. Gowdy likes to say, green is go, yellow means speed up, and <laughs> red means okay, you actually got to stop. So um, pay pay attention if you could. Uh, but Mrs. Terry, you're now recognized for five. Again, push, push that, that talk button if you could. It should illuminate. Thank right. you. There you go. Uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, good morning. Um, my name is Josephine Terry, and I am the mother of Brian Terry. Um, my son was first a Marine, a local police officer, and finally a Border Patrol agent. He loved his country and everything about it. He dedicated his entire adult life to the protection of the American people. Brian believed in truth and justice. Just over six years ago, Brian was on patrol in the Arizona desert. In the darkness, he was shot and killed by a drug cartel trafficker. I picked out my son's casket through weeping and tears. At his burial, Brian's coffin was covered with American flag. My only goal was to make sure he was laid to rest with honors. That honor has been insulted by cover-ups and deception by the very people he served. I refuse to also let our flag cover up the fact of how why Brian died or allow it to hide from those who were responsible. I need you to help me. I need you to help me now. ATF, the Department of Justice, and possibly people even higher up in the government not only intended to provide thousands of guns to the Mexico cartel. They gave their plan a glorious name, which was Fast and Furious. From the moment a bullet was fired from one of those Fast and Furious guns, from the moment that bullet entered Brian's body and ended his life, Brian's government, my government, your government, began to hide the truth. One of ATF's Fast and Furious leaders dismissed Brian's death by saying, you have to scramble a few eggs to make an omelet. That man has since been promoted by ATF and given awards by the Justice Department. Did you know that? 
ATF and DOJ made sure that all those involved were given new jobs or allowed to retire with their government pensions and benefits. No one was punished or prosecuted. When I pay my taxes and when you pay yours, we are funding the comforts of those who helped murder my son. We know that Brian encountered bad people that night he was killed. We know there was a gun battle. We know Brian was shot and killed. We know the gun used to kill him was fired by a drug trafficker. We know the gun was put in the murder hands by our government. And there is so much more that we don't know. I need you to have President Obama's executive privilege order that hides many of the facts from Fast and Furious overturned. I need you to ask President Trump to keep the promise he made to my family on his campaign trail to let you see those documents. Only one possible motivation remains for all of those involved who have covered up Fast and Furious. That is to conceal their own shame and disgrace, quite possibly, their crime. I need you to find out why Fast and Furious was even allowed to happen. I also need you to find out why those involved were all given soft landings for their lives and their careers. And not just the lower level people, but just the, and just the scapegoats. But how high did the knowledge and approval go? Our country deserves the truth regardless of how embarrassing it may be. Brian believed in the truth and justice and he died for it. What he would never would have accepted and what I cannot accept now on his behalf is the cover up of the truth and the avoidance of justice. As the chairman and members of the oversight committee, I sit before you and plead with you to fulfill the jobs that you have been elected to. I am giving you my faith that as a public servant, you believe in truth and justice as much as Brian did. I have a picture of my son. He died for us, he died for all of us. He bled to death in the darkness of, of the Arizona desert mostly alone to protect this company. Please protect Brian now. Put your party policies aside. Fulfill your obligations to the American people. Present all of the people who voted for you into office and demand answers and full accountability. And on behalf of my family and myself and my son, I ask you to please see this through to a truthful and just conclusion. Thank you. Thank you, appreciate that. Mr. Heyer, you're now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Before I uh, begin my comments, I just wanted to ask your indulgence. Uh, as I describe the many indignities uh, that the Terry family suffered over the last six years, um, no American family deserves to be treated like they have uh, by their government. I see a lot of familiar faces here. Uh, well, not a lot, but several familiar faces, and I, I want to thank those members that were here six uh, and a half years ago, and six years ago, almost to the day. Um, thank you for your leadership, uh, Chairman Issa, uh, Congressman Gowdy, and uh, the other members of the Oversight Committee that originally fought for truth and uh, the answers that the Terry family deserved. I think it's fair to say that Americans maintain a strong disdain for dirty little secrets, especially when those secrets are being kept by government officials looking to hide poor judgment and misconduct. The death of Brian Terry in 2010 served as the catalyst that exposed a pattern of poor judgment and misconduct by several top officials in the Department of Justice, the U.S. Attorney's Office, and the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. Despite Brian Terry's death, the full extent of the fatally flawed gun trafficking investigation known as Operation Fast and Furious was not immediately made known to the American public because government officials were keeping a dirty little secret. Good morning, Chairman Chaffetz, Chairman Issa, Ranking Member Lynch, Senator Grassley, and other honorable members of this committee. My name is Robert Heyer. I'm the cousin of slain U.S. Border Patrol Agent Brian Terry and Chairman of the Brian Terry Foundation. It's been almost six years since I first appeared before this committee. When I was here last, the impact of Brian's death was still fresh 
and the revelation that our government had provided the very weapons to the men that killed Brian was almost too shocking to believe. Over time, I have developed a better understanding of Operation Fast and Furious and the questionable behavior of the government officials involved in that secret investigation. My comments to this committee six years ago were tempered because of my strong belief that once the facts of this case were known, our president and our attorney general would move quickly and decisively to fully investigate the investigation. Back then, I was confident that our leaders would ultimately find and hold those government officials responsible for the many failures of that poorly thought out gun trafficking investigation. Even the members of this committee promised to fully investigate and seek justice in this matter. Over time, I saw a Department of Justice brimming with incompetence and arrogance. I witnessed government officials less interested in the truth and facts behind the ill-conceived investigation and more interested in moving to contain the public relations disaster of a U.S. Border Patrol agent being murdered by drug cartel members carrying weapons supplied to them by ATF. Agents in ATF who were privy to this information were expected to be good soldiers and keep their mouths shut. Inconceivably, no one in our government spoke openly about the connection between Operation Fast and Furious and Brian Terry's murder. Brian Terry's murder was the absolute worst case scenario for those involved in orchestrating this gun trafficking investigation. Just as some ATF agents had warned, a U.S. law enforcement officer had been murdered with weapons allowed to walk during that investigation. The immediate reaction by officials at ATF, the U.S. Attorney's Office, and DOJ was to limit the release of information and to ultimately deny the fact that weapons were ever walked to straw buyers working for the Mexican drug cartels. The fact that two assault weapons found at the murder scene were purchased a year earlier by one of the primary suspects in the investigation was deemed extremely sensitive and only discussed among top officials in these organizations. The Terry family and I believe that government officials responsible for Fast and Furious were not only trying to contain political damage, but were also trying to attempt to cover up the link between that investigation and Brian Terry's murder. There was a little dirty secret that was being kept from the American people. Over the last six years, we've witnessed a number of examples of clear incompetence and arrogance exhibited by those in ATF, the U.S. Attorney's Office, and DOJ as they attempted to contain the public relations disaster and distance themselves from the Fast and Furious investigation. A lack of transparency was noted in my many dealings with government officials over this time, and I began to understand why these officials were keeping the facts of the case from the Terrys. I remember at Brian Terry's family, then DHS Secretary Janet Napolitano and Commissioner Alan Burson traveled to Detroit to meet with the Terry family. Despite being the senior officials present, neither Secretary Napolitano or Commissioner Burson chose to inform the family that the two assault weapons found at the scene were linked to the gun trafficking investigation. It should be noted that these two senior officials had just come back from Tucson, Arizona, where they had been extensively briefed on Terry, Brian Terry's murder by the head of the FBI in Tucson and the U.S. Attorney's Office. In January 2011, the Terry's attended the public memorial service held in, in Arizona. Again, Commissioner Bernson attended, along with this, uh, U.S. Attorney Dennis Burke, to meet with the family. Once again, neither official chose to share uh, the information that the men that killed Brian Terry carried weapons provided them to them by ATF. It wasn't until February that the family began to learn the truth. The facts were not provided by government officials, but rather by a lone whistleblower who was alarmed at the lack of transparency surrounding Brian Terry's death. With the exception of this lone ATF agent, no one in government was willing to talk publicly about the dirty little secret known as Operation Fast and Furious and its connection to Brian Terry's murder. In February 2011, the family of Brian Terry learned for the first time through a television journalist that the weapons found at the murder scene were in fact connected to Fast and Furious. No one in the federal government had ever spoken to the Terry family about this connection, despite the claims of ATF Special Agent John Dotson. 
Officials in ATF and DOJ continued to deny the guns had been sold to individuals known as straw buyers and that those weapons eventually ended up in the hands of Mexican drug cartels. It was then, only after the news media began to publish Agent Dotson's claims that U.S. Attorney in Arizona, Dennis Burke, offered to provide information to the Terry family. And in March of 2011, Burke traveled to the Terry home in Michigan. When asked about the origin of weapons found at the murder scene, Mr. Burke denied they were part of Operation Fast and Furious. Instead, he told family members the weapons were found at the murder scene originated from a gun store in Texas. We now know that this was untrue. We know now through emails obtained by this committee that Mr. Burke, without a doubt, on the evening of Brian Terry's murder, knew that the two AK-47 style assault weapons found at the murder scene were from Op Operation Fast and Furious. We know now that on the same day of Terry, Brian Terry's death, DOJ and ATF personnel were scrambling to find and arrest Jaime Avila Jr., the well-known straw buyer of these exact weapons. Despite these facts, no one in government wanted to talk about their dirty little secret with the Terry family or the American public. In April of 2011, I traveled to Phoenix and received a briefing from the U.S. Attorney's Office on the status of the murder investigation. I was told that the FBI had conducted ballistic tests on the two weapons found in the murder scene and the bullet recovered from Brian's body. I was told that the FBI had determined without a doubt that neither weapon recovered from the murder scene had fired the fatal bullet. I later obtained that FBI ballistics report from sources outside of the DOJ. What that report really says is that the test results were inconclusive due to deformities of the bullet recovered from Brian's body. I have always wondered why the U.S. Attorney in Arizona and his staff were not more precise in their description of that FBI ballistics report. Senator Grassley already spoke about the letter sent by DOJ on February 4th, 2011. Even today, I find it professionally incomprehensible that the DOJ officials failed to simply speak with ATF agent John Dotson and interview him about Operation Fast and Furious. Had these officials chosen to speak with Agent Johnson, they would have learned the truth about gun walking immediately. It was about this time that Assistant Attorney General Lanny Brewer arrogantly stated that if Brian Terry had not been killed with an Operation Fast and Furious gun, he would have been killed by some other gun. I was sickened by Mr. Brewer's comments, not only because they were incredibly callous, but also because Mr. Brewer's comments reflected an unprecedented level of arrogance within the Department of Justice at the time. We know now that Mr. Brewer himself received briefings on Operation Fast and Furious and failed to exercise the good judgment and common sense to foresee the public safety ramifications of letting 2,000 military-style weapons walk to the Mexican drug cartels. Mr. Brewer's callous comments also failed to take into account that Brian Terry and his BORTAC team would have used different tactics when trying to apprehend a drug cartel rip crew if they had only known that ATF and the Department of Justice had armed these individuals with state-of-the-art military weapons. If only Mr. Brewer, the DOJ attorneys, and the ATF bosses in Phoenix Field Division had not kept this dirty little secret from the U.S. Border Patrol. I believe that if Brian Terry and his team had known this information, chances are Brian would be alive today. Unfortunately, Brian and his team had no idea that the rip crew they encountered that night would be emboldened by the weapons that they carried and were ready to use those weapons against U.S. law enforcement. The most disappointing and demoralizing act of all for the Terry family was in June of 2011 when President Obama asserted executive privilege over documents being sought by congressional investigators. The President's order effectively ended the hope of the Terry family to fully understand why the Department of Justice denied gun walking in the first place. My personal disappointment in the President on this decision to invoke executive privilege in this matter continues to this day. In September 2012, we read the long-awaited report on Operation Fast and Furious from the Inspector General. The report identified several Department of Justice employees who, part who bore particular responsibility for the many mistakes made in Operation Fast and Furious. 
It should be noted that these individuals have continued in their employment with the government, despite the findings of the IG's report and the death of Brian Terry. Additionally, ATF's own professional review board had recommended termination for at least one of these individuals, yet ATF leadership failed to act on this recommendation. Instead, these employees were instructed to keep their mouths shut, and in return, they would be provided with private defense attorneys whose exorbitant fees would be paid by the American taxpayers. In 2014, I spoke with the lead special agent investigating the murder of Brian Terry. The agent told me that she had not been initially informed by ATF agents or the U.S. Attorney's Office personnel that the weapons recovered from the scene of the murder had been traced to Operation Fast and Furious. Imagine my shock in learning that members of ATF's Phoenix Field Division and the U.S. Attorney's Office in Arizona kept this important piece of information from the lead investigator in a federal agent's murder. That FBI agent went on to say that she learned of this connection only when the news media began to report the link almost two months after Brian Terry's murder. Incredibly, not even this lead FBI agent was allowed to know the dirty little secret. Did members of ATF's Phoenix Field Division in the U.S. Attorney's Office in Arizona attempt to keep the details of Fast and Furious and its connection to Brian Terry's murder from becoming public knowledge? We know now through review of official emails that ATF officials in Phoenix associated with the investigation and members of the U.S. Attorney's Office there knew on the evening of Brian's murder that the two weapons found at the murder scene were directly linked to the investigation by means of weapons trace data. However, this critical information was not passed to the lead FBI case agent investigating Brian Terry's murder. I have also witnessed a continued pattern of abuse and retaliation directed against ATF Special Agent John Dotson by members of ATF. Incredulously, senior members of that agency continue to blame Agent Dotson for going public with the information connecting Brian Terry's murder with Operation Fast and Furious. I have watched other agents who were regarded as good soldiers be promoted while Agent Dotson remains in the same pay grade shunned by most of the agency. Ladies and gentlemen, it's time for the dirty little secrets of Operation Fast and Furious to be fully exposed. A number of lingering questions should be asked. Why was Operation Fast and Furious initiated and then suddenly concealed by senior members of ATF and the Department of Justice? Why did the Department of Justice deny the tactic of gun walking only to retract that denial weeks later? How many Fast and Furious weapons have been recovered over the last 10 years? How many people besides Brian Terry have been killed or wounded by individuals carrying Operation Fast and Furious weapons? Was there an attempt to keep the link between Operation Fast and Furious and Brian Terry's murder from becoming public knowledge? And finally, did senior government officials engage in behavior considered as obstructing Congress? We urge the Trump administration and the Department of Justice to revisit the claim of executive privilege as it relates to Operation Fast and Furious. The American public deserves to see the documents previously sealed by executive order and for those documents to be turned over to congressional investigators. We need all of you, both Republicans and Democrats, to exercise your responsibility of oversight in this matter. Brian Terry gave his life protecting the United States and he deserves at the very minimum that we honor his sacrifice by demanding answers to the many questions left unanswered surrounding Operation Fast and Furious, and once and for all, putting an end to this dirty little secret. Mr. Heyer, thank you. We appreciate your testimony. Special Agent Dodson, you are now recognized. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman Chaffetz, uh, Ranking Member Lynch, honorable members of this committee, Thank you for continuing efforts and investigation into this and many other matters that come before you. Your duty is an important one. I'm honored and humbled to have received an invitation to again address this body and to take part, however small, in such a fundamental and important proceeding in the governing of our nation. It is a privilege that I do not take lightly. Nearly six years ago to the day, I sat at this table with my fellow whistleblowers as we described for you the ATF's <clears throat> excuse me, ill-conceived and deadly gun-walking operation known as Fast and Furious. 
Today I've been asked to return and to tell you what has transpired since, the aftermath, if you will. First, allow me to say that it is not my desire nor my intent to sit here and cry foul, purport myself as victim, or to seek sympathy. Nothing I say here today can compare to the ultimate sacrifice of Brian Terry or to the immeasurable loss and injustice suffered by the Terry family. I am here simply to tell you my story, and you will conclude from it what you will, but it is just that, mine alone, just one of many from an untold number of whistleblowers, each of, you, who, each of whom have a story all their own, some having fared far better, some worse, but each important, each personal to them, and all worthy of being heard. It is my hope that my story will not give cause to dwell on those things that have already occurred, but rather utilize to help us pursue a common goal, that of learning from the past to better ourselves as individuals, as a government, and as a nation. Since the moment I first voiced objection to the strategy of gun walking and pointed out the all too foreseeable and tragic consequences of it, I began being subjected to reprisals, initially from my immediate supervisor, then my chain of command, and soon thereafter from the uppermost echelons of my agency, the ATF. Later, after being compelled to blow the whistle and bring the deadly ramifications of it to the light of others, to you, and to the public, I found myself squarely in the crosshairs of the Department of Justice itself. That decision, the single act of standing up and saying what we are doing is wrong, instantly took my standing from being that of an agent of a government to an enemy of the state. United in their hubris and without ever once talking to me, asking me a single question, or properly investigating what it was that I was actually reporting, ATF and DOJ officials implemented an all-out campaign to silence and discredit me. When I began preparations for this hearing, I started to list the many acts of retaliation and retributions that had befallen me as a result of blowing the whistle. And truthfully, that list soon grew much too long and much too cumbersome to be recited here today before you. No less than three plots to have me arrested and criminally charged, subjected to multiple internal affairs investigations, my communications monitored and my activities surveilled, I was lied about, disparaged, publicly attacked, ridiculed, libeled. I've been transferred 11 times, denied promotion, ostracized, barred from government workplaces, and banned from public buildings, including those open to the public. Uh, and the list goes on and on. Suffice to say, the last six to seven years at ATF have not been the best for me or my career. Of all the things that I have encountered and experienced over the past few years, the single most challenging aspect for me has been the ostracism. When I had a valid viewpoint to share that was viewed as unfavorable to the agency, I immediately became the outcast, dubbed the one who can't get along, accused of being unethical, and became the one whose opinions and views were not even valued enough to simply be heard. Open discussion was off the table, and the order was handed down, contact with Dotson is detrimental to any ATF career. The ignorant assumptions about my motives and the absurd judgments of my character being used as the reasons to cast me out simply are not true, yet they have been and continue to be the single most difficult reprisal strategy for me to personally overcome. You see, the fact is, before Fast and Furious, I was a good agent, experienced and dedicated, hardworking and respected. ATF had always been good to me. I believed that I worked for a good agency full of good people. I felt that I was part of something bigger, and I was proud to carry the badge. Never could I have foreseen the many twists and turns of how this would eventually end up affecting every aspect of my life, personally and professionally. These days I remain in a state of purgatory, an agent with no agency. All that has happened and all that has transpired was not because I had done something wrong, but because I did what I thought was right, what I thought I was supposed to do, and merely what I thought was expected of me. As an ordinary GS-13, field agent, I found myself in the extraordinary situation, adrift in some deep and unfamiliar waters and having to navigate the many storms and the perilous hazards. But this journey, despite hardship, mistake, failure, and loss, has taught me much more than I ever knew I needed to learn. Woven in the battered sail of life's biggest trials is where we find the threads of life's greatest lessons, if only we are willing to learn them. My desire here today is to offer insight for calming the seas for future whistleblowers, as well as helping Brian Terry's family in getting their deserved answers to the so many lingering questions. In doing so, I hope to assist this committee in its prescribed duty of oversight and reform, which is essential to our government's original purpose, serving the people of this nation. I welcome and encourage all questions that will assist this committee in achieving these outcomes. Thank you, and my wishes for a speedy recovery to Ranking Member Cummings. Special Agent Dodson, thank you. Thank you for your service, and thank you for your, your testimony. We'll now recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Issa, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That's very kind. Uh, maybe I'll start off by, uh, by saying, Special Agent Dodson, uh, you look older. It's been a tough, tough six years. Special Agent Hire, 
Bob, you too look older. And uh, when we started this, you were protecting the president. You were a Secret Service agent heading up San Diego. Uh, now you're retired. A lot has happened. Josie, you look a lot older. This has been unforgivable and unreasonable to do to any mother. And you have my apology. And I apology, I think, of everyone on the dais for taking so long. But today, I, I'm hoping to maybe give you a little different view than you would have heard from others. You heard a little of it from Senator Grassley. What you're going through, what you've suffered through for six years, at its best, you will suffer through for another two. And the reason is, we're in a struggle for whether this happens to another family. If the Trump administration were to simply hand over the documents in a negotiated agreement, and the case were closed. A bad ruling by a judge who, were, who was appointed by President Obama would stand, not as a precedent, but certainly as something to be looked at the next time a case came from this or any committee of the Congress. Only by having her bad ruling reversed by an appellate court will there be a clear understanding that the President's disingenuous, obstructive, false assertion of executive privilege was wrong. And the remaining documents not handed over voluntarily, or a portion of them, but rather for all time, the understanding that what you've gone through should be quickly dealt with in a matter of weeks or months, because a court would understand that there's a precedent that says very clearly the cover-up of a crime cannot be held. Now, to be honest, there's a good precedent. It was Richard Nixon's case, and it went all the way to the Supreme Court. In a matter of months, in a fraction of what you've gone through, the court decided those tapes were to be turned over. But for some inexplicable reason, the courts have slowed to a crawl the consideration of these cases. So. I wish I could ask you a lot of questions. I think your testimony makes clear what you've gone through and what you continue going through. But if we're going to protect people like Special Agent Dotson, we're going to need a quick resolution of what they've given us and not a decade of waiting. And Mrs. Terry, Josie, if we're not going to have this happen again, we're going to need a strong reversal of a decision that if, if you will, codified the wrongdoing of the Attorney General. Now, I presented a T-shirt to uh, uh, Senator Grassley, and it's a little bit lighthearted, but it really isn't. One of the documents that was covered up was his disdain for this committee and the work we were doing. ISA and his idiot cronies was a verbatim of what he was saying, but it was much more than that. As you'll see in the report that's being published, and thank you, Chairman, for bringing it to light, some of those documents that came after my chairmanship was over made it clear that they had deliberately not searched on the terms necessary to give the documents that would have given us a more full picture. Another form of obstruction of justice. Clearly, the Attorney General lied to Congress when he made it seem like he wasn't deeply involved in this when in fact he was having a daily briefing and update on it. So one of the things I'm going to say today is that I'm calling on the, uh, the Speaker of the House to stop negotiations with the Trump administration because nothing the Trump administration can give would guarantee that another family wouldn't go through exactly what you've gone through in the years to come. A quick consideration by a court of appeals, a reversal and a remand would get you your documents, but it also would guarantee that some other mother, some other cousin, some other agent wouldn't go through what you've gone through for six years. Now, that's not an easy request, but I hope as we all seek those documents, we also seek a codified solution to this. And by the way, when those documents are completely uncovered, I would hope that this committee would refer for criminal prosecution, the former Attorney General, Dennis Burke, and others for crimes I believe they committed 
In fact, I'd like to know, and probably never will, did the President of the United States, when he issued a broad executive privilege, know that it was false, and clearly false, as we have discovered, that these documents were never anywhere close to what a, an attorney and a constitutional scholar, as he would like to be known, had asserted. Maybe it was just carelessness. Maybe he did not uh, look, and he took the word of the Attorney General. That is a further indictment of the Attorney General if it happened. So I plan on continuing to push this with your help, with the Chairman's help and others, but I would ask you to be patient because to get to the truth and to a solution will take time. Thank you, and thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your indulgence. Yield back. Thank the gentleman. We'll now recognize the gentleman from Massachusetts, uh, Mr. Lynch. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I uh, first want to thank Mr. Terry, Mr. Heyer, and Special Agent Dodson for your courage in coming forth uh, today and testifying uh, in Brian's memory. Uh, your experience, I think, is, is a painful reminder that uh, we have law enforcement officers uh, throughout our government that put their lives on the line each and every day on our behalf. Uh, Brian Terry's life, I think, exemplified this dedication, uh, not only as, as a Border Patrol agent, but also as, as a uh, United States Marine and as a police officer uh, back in Michigan. I do understand that a foundation has been created in, in, in uh, honor and memory of Brian Terry, and I, I want to just take a few minutes today uh, before this committee considering uh, his legacy and uh, his life and his courageous service. Mr. Heyer, I understand that you, you are the uh, chairman, is it? Uh, chairman of the Brian Terry Foundation, and one of its missions is to provide assistance to family members of Border Patrol agents who are injured or are killed in the line of duty. Uh, can you tell the committee a little bit about this? Well, thank you, Mr. Lynch. Absolutely. But the, the Brian Terry Foundation uh, is, continues to support uh, the family, uh, that is the U.S. Border Patrol. And uh, unfortunately, we know deaths are going to occur in the line of duty, and that's when uh, uh, one of our missions is to come to the financial and emotional aid of uh, family members. And uh, the second big piece would be our scholarship program, specifically designed for men and women uh, looking to go to college and earn a degree in criminal justice that are going to allow them to pursue careers in law enforcement. That's a great way to, to uh, I think, carry on Brian's legacy. Uh, we did have one other issue up here before this committee that has some parallels. Uh, uh, as many people remember, uh, a young man from Massachusetts, my, my home state, uh, Glenn Darty, was actually killed on the roof of the Benghazi compound. Uh, he was a, uh, a CIA contractor, and so under the regulations, under the Base Act of uh, you know, 1945, I believe, uh, he was ineligible for a death benefit uh, because of his status. And uh, it was really the work of this committee. Uh, and. Uh, Democrat and Republican working together, uh, we got, we got uh, the department to, to change their policy so that his family was able to receive uh, the death benefit uh, as, they, as they so deserved. He was a former Navy SEAL, uh, had done multiple tours in Iraq and Afghanistan, and, uh, but you know, because of the uh, bureaucracy and the regulations, uh, they were denied uh, justice. And, uh, I just, I just want to say that uh, I would ask the Department of Justice to review its policies and procedures as well uh, for responding to families such as the Terry family uh, when federal agents uh, lose their lives in, in the line of duty in defending this country. Uh, I would just say, Mrs., Mrs. Terry, do you have anything that you'd like to add uh, with respect to how uh, Brian's legacy might be more appropriately remembered and supported, as well as his, his colleagues? Yeah. Uh, mostly, Brian, um, mostly Brian's legacy is uh, remembered by his foundation. Um, like last year, we only got 15 scholarships. This year, we got 40. So, wow. So it, the word is getting out, and um, he, was, he was all about learning, so I think... I think that we make. I think he would like that. Is the Justice Department a, a uh, 
participant or a sponsor or a supporter of, of the, uh, the scholarship effort? Could I? Not that I'm aware of, no. Okay, and you're the chairman, so you, you would know. All right, again, uh, I wanna thank you for your willingness to come here. Uh, Special Agent Dodson, uh, how can we help? How can we help you? Uh, you've shown a tremendous amount of, of courage in, in uh, calling out the government when they were engaging in uh, unlawful activity that endangered the citizens of the United States in, in complete dereliction of their, their, their duty. Uh, are there things that this committee can continue to do to, to help you? And, uh, and make sure that uh, you're treated fairly. First of all, thank you, sir. I appreciate it. Um, I, to be honest with you, and in short, I, I don't know. Um, the problem, as I see it, or for, from where I sit, is not so much with the current leadership that we have at ATF. I don't believe they are directly responsible for any of the acts um, that have taken place since they took over the reins. But this culture that Senator Grassley talked about in his remarks to you is, is the problem. And I don't, I don't want to be that kind of person that comes here and tells you about the problems and doesn't offer you a solution. But quite honestly, I, I don't know how you fix it. Yeah. It's this middle management, this core, this bureaucracy that picks a side. And once sides are chosen, um, decisions are made, opinions are rendered, and it's done. It's, and I don't know how you overcome that. I've been trying for almost seven years now and have had absolutely no luck in doing so. Um, but I, I, I appreciate it. I appreciate you having me here and um, I appreciate everything that you guys are doing for the Terry family and for Brian's legacy. And as much as I appreciate the offer, again, I, I don't know. I, I, right. we'll I don't have any request on. of you. All right. Thank you and I thank you for your service and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank the gentleman. We'll recognize the gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Gowdy, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Terry and Mr. Heyer, I want to begin by expressing our condolences and sympathies um, ongoing for uh, the loss of your son, Special Agent Terry. And I want to ask you a question in, in, in just a moment, but Special Agent Dobson, I, there was a franticness, an obsessiveness exhibited by federal law enforcement officers with respect to narcotics, a controlled delivery of pornography, uh, even money, uh, which um, is not inherently dangerous as, as firearms and, and narcotics and pornography would be, th this obsessiveness, this franticness of never letting that walk. So that would be um, only intensified if you were working with firearms. From the very first moment I heard about Fast and Furious, I, I, it has vexed me how anyone could have ever thought this investigative scheme was going to work. I, I don't know how a line agent would think it was going to work, and that's why line agents have supervisors and assistant U.S. attorneys and U.S. attorneys to say, wait, your heart might be in the right place, but this may be the dumbest idea I have ever heard. How did this investigative scheme get started? Who, who thought it was ever going to work? Well, sir, I can tell you, I, I, I can't tell you where the idea originated from or who was ultimately responsible for beginning it. But apparently, or what I can tell you directly is everyone in my chain of command, up to and including the former director, was well briefed on the case, well versed on it, and knew the strategy coming and going. And they all thought it was a great idea. The U.S. Attorney's Office in Arizona, as well as up to Maine Justice, were briefed on it. You, you yourself know the requirements of big cases or big problems, and the briefings you have to go all the way to OEO, the Office of Enforcement Operations, to do some of the techniques involved in the investigation that we were doing. The OSADEF funding that we had, the proposals that were written for that, it was all spelled out, sir. Everyone knew it. It was there in black and white. And I always thought as soon as we got to the next level, somebody's going to shut it down. As soon as they hear about it, it's going to get shut down. But it, that never happened. It kept getting more funding, more approval, more attaboys. Uh, the people were, that were running it were called to D.C. several times to brief it at headquarters, at uh, special operations divisions, and over at Maine Justice. And it just seemed, 
it, it was the new, the new strategy. All the rule, rule books that you and I are aware of were thrown out. I worked with DEA for a number of years. We were never allowed to walk dope, not a gram of it. And walking money was, we would have to go and work a case through a county to get approval to that. DEA would not authorize it. So when I heard that we were walking guns, it was completely alien to me. Well, I'm glad to hear that because it's alien to me too. I, I cannot imagine letting someone that you even suspect to be a straw purchaser purchase a firearm and then let that firearm uh, navigate its way through uh, the criminal element only to be recovered at a crime scene. I, I, I just, I find it unfathomable that anyone could ever have thought this would turn out any differently than with the mother of a slain federal law enforcement agent and or ordinary citizen sitting at a table. I, I, I honestly, I have tried to give the benefit. I, I actually like federal law enforcement officers. I'm probably biased towards them. I'm just struggling to understand how this ever could have turned out any other way. As soon as the gun leaves the parking lot, unless you're maintaining constant surveillance, then you've lost the gun. And then if it crosses the border, God knows what you're going to do with it. And, and, and then when you learn they didn't even let our Mexican counterparts in law enforcement know what was going on, I, this is the most eminently predictable uh, tragedy that I've been connected with since I've been in Congress. It could not have turned out any other way. Um, Ms. Terry, I want to ask you one question, and then I will have a very brief conversation with the chairman. For lots of America, um, they view your son as a hero, but all they have seen is a still photograph of a young man in uniform. What would you like our fellow citizens to know about your son that they may not know? Brian was, he was like a special, special person. He was dedicated, he was a true American. He was just dedicated to his country. He loved, he loved being in the limelight. He loved helping people, protecting people. And that's what he always wanted to do. Well, thank you. He, um, he was wired differently. The different uniforms that he wore, uh, most of us are not wired uh, to want to run towards danger. Um, most of us are wired to protect ourselves first and foremost and not others. So you raised an outstanding human being and I know that, uh, hope that that provides some level of comfort to you even in the throes of your grief. Uh, in conclusion, Mr. Chairman, I would just say this. Um, Perhaps I have missed something. I thought the administration said that they were not part of the approval and were not part of the process and had nothing to do with this investigative scheme. So I guess I'm vexed in how you can use a defense of deliberative process if you were not part of the process. And I would encourage you to share this report with the chairman of the subcommittee that provides appropriations for the Department of Justice. His name is John Culbertson from Texas. And I would encourage you to share this report for this reason. We all have privileges and rights, um, and all across America, every day people waive those privileges and rights because there's an incentive to waive them. Um, I would give DOJ an incentive to waive their privilege, and I might do it through the subcommittee chair on appropriations. Thank the gentleman. We'll now recognize the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Raskin, for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. And I'd like to start by offering my appreciation and my continuing condolences to the Terry family. Mrs. Terry and Mr. Heyer, thank you for coming here today to share your story with us. Brian Terry was uh, an extraordinary young man with an extraordinary legacy now. And thank you for putting it to use for whole new generations of uh, idealistic young people going into law enforcement as Brian was. I also want to associate myself very strongly with the remarks of Mr. Gowdy. I'm uh, dumbfounded and baffled uh, by this law enforcement technique, which just seems patently ridiculous uh, to me. But again, I'm, <laughs> I'm not steeped in the field, but it just doesn't seem to make any sense, uh, the, this uh, idea that was deployed in the Fast and Furious investigation. Um, we were hoping to hear from Attorney General Sessions today, but I, I take it he declined to come or to send someone in his place. 
but uh, Agent Dotson, I had a question for you. On January 27th of 2011, Senator Grassley, then the ranking member of the Judiciary Committee, sent a letter to ATF's acting director, Melson, requesting information about gun running operations on the southwest border. And his letter marked the beginning, as I understand it, of the years-long investigation by Congress into uh, operations wide receiver and fast and furious. Can you uh, briefly explain the role of Senator Grassley in launching the gun walking investigations and bringing all of this to light? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, the role of Senator Grassley and his staff was instrumental. Um, uh, dare I even say life saving for me at some point. They were the, uh, the only, in, only ones it, at this level. Once DOJ had been informed, you, you have to understand, I was. I didn't understand the concept either or how this was ever approved. So when, when DOJ or, or an ATF headquarters originally denied that they were ever doing this, I kept thinking, okay, well, as soon as it gets to the next level, the next level, then somebody's gonna shut it down and we'll realize, well, that never happened. It was only Senator Grassley's office and his staff that, um, that listened to me and, and considered and looked at the evidence and the information that I had and started asking the questions about it. Um, they were. They were great, and Senator Grassley did it, it to me, I believe, for no other reason than it was the right thing to do. Um, he was in the minority at the time in the Senate, and uh, as such, he was uh, uh, the, the minority leader and didn't have a subpoena power. Let me pause right there, for because it goes to my point. Um, he, he indeed is a, a great champion of transparency in government and public integrity, and we owe him a great deal of credit for his diligent oversight, which ended up exposing uh, this terribly flawed logic behind the gun walking operations in Arizona and led to the reforms at ATF. Unfortunately, we just learned of a serious barrier to Congress's ability to conduct exactly this kind of oversight that Senator Grassley uh, was engaged in. Last week it was reported that the White House had directed government agencies not to cooperate or respond at all to oversight requests from members of Congress uh, who are not committee chairmen, in other words, from the minority side, as Senator Grassley was, and it appears to stem from a, a flawed new opinion from the Office of Legal Counsel saying that individual members, quote, do not have the authority to conduct oversight in the absence of a specific delegation by a full House committee or subcommittee. I believe this analysis is completely incorrect, constitutionally unfounded, and will be of great detriment to the public interest. Um, Agent Dotson, when Senator Grassley wrote the, Ob the Obama administration seeking information about Fast and Furious uh, in the minority, um, he was a ranking member, not a committee chairman, as you point out. Do you agree that he still deserved a response? Do you think it's important for all members of Congress to be able to exercise the constitutional oversight power? Uh, first of all, I, I also want to say after dealing with Senator Grassley's office and then Chairman Issa at the time, he and his staff, this committee staff, took up the gauntlet and, and, and helped us all immensely. And, and I just want to make sure that he's thanked as well, and, and your staff and Steve and just everyone. But to your question, sir, I, I am not an attorney. Um, I, don't, I don't necessarily know what those decisions So as a matter caused. of public interest, leaving As a matter of public way. interest, I yeah. can tell you what, I found it completely apprehensible or completely unacceptable to me that the administration would tell Senator Grassley, the ranking member of that committee, that he had no business to do oversight and that they weren't going to provide him any information or any documents. Yeah. Um, well, good. I, I appreciate that. And I, I will, Mr. Chairman, ask colleagues on both sides of the aisle to join me in urging the administration to respect all members of Congress and all of our oversight response. Happened to be a lie. I, that, that goes so, to another so, question, so, which is I do think that... So that, maybe, that, the, maybe it's about getting the truth in addition to well, who gets it. Number one, an answer, and number two, a truthful answer. With that, I concur. That, that yeah. I think that's implied in the Constitution. The whole Constitution uh, is based on the truth. It's based on the idea that that's why we have an oversight responsibility, because in a democracy, the people have the right to a truth. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman yields back, and as I just want to note, as I noted earlier, I, I, I agree with you. I think it is a dangerous precedent and unwarranted and un, unfounded to suggest that just uh, committee chairman can initiate um, something that the administration would actually respond to. I think every member of this body, uh, no matter which party you belong to and no matter who's in power, um, has a duty, a responsibility. It's one of the core things we do is provide oversight over the executive branch. It's not just delegated to 18 chairmen. 
Um, and and thank you for your leadership on that, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you. Um, I'll now recognize myself for five minutes. Um, Ms. Mr. Heyer, um, I want to talk about your, the, the family uh, tried to do a motion to intervene. Um, it, it, the, the, uh, during this prosecution, um, let me back up. The Terry family tried to get some rights from the Department of Justice. Tell us about that experience. German, it seems like every interaction with the Department of Justice became a battle. They fought and continue to fight every request, every attempt that we've made to gather information, to understand uh, the, the aspects of uh, the, uh, why DOJ did what they did. It, it's been a contentious relationship, and that's why I said early on, no American family deserves to be treated like the Terry's were treated by their government, by their attorney general. Now, regard everything was a battle and uh, remains contentious to this day. The, the uh, Department of Justice, uh, uh, in this case, argued that the family was, quote, was not directly or proximately harmed by the illegal purchase of the murdered weapon. The family does not meet the definition of a crime victim, end quote, was the position of the Department of Justice. Uh, I hope that uh, the department is learning this lesson, and I, I can't imagine all the horror and things that you've gone through then to be denied his status as a crime victim in this case is just, I, I just really, it's just so abhorrent. Uh, Mr. Dob Dobson, um, tell us about your, your personal uh, situation. You've had a list of so many, you, you, at one point I think you said something like the list of, of retaliation is so long you stop counting, it's almost too many pages to write being banned from public buildings, things like that. You're still currently a special agent with the ATF, correct? Uh, yes, sir, that's correct. Although I don't report to the ATF, I currently report to the FBI office in uh, Tucson. Tell us about some of the retaliation that you and your wife and your family experienced. Um, well, again, I don't, I don't mean to dredge everything back up, but there were, there were several attempts or threats to prosecute me criminally um, there have been at least three internal affairs investigations that I was the subject of that I, that I know about, and I didn't find out about those until after the fact. I've either been transferred or had to be transferred 11 times, transferred or reassigned. Um, I have been routinely locked out of ATF computer systems, barred from ATF workspaces. Um, I was libeled by the Department of Justice, um, a hit piece in a major publication was sanctioned on me. I, it's just, it, it just goes on and on, sir. We well, could, what, what did the Inspector General, when they dove into it, what did they find? Um, I like to call the Inspector General's report issued on Fast and Furious, 512 pages of you should have listened to John Dotson, because it pretty much substantiates every allegation, everything that I said was occurring. How long, do you, do you know how long they conducted this investigation? How many times did they interview you, that sort of thing? Um, I interviewed initially once in Arizona, and then they interviewed me again here in D.C. On, on the actual Fast and Furious investigation. I want to say that it began in maybe January of 2011, and I think the report was issued September of 2012, if that sounds right. And At one point, I was involved in including Fast and Furious six OIG investigations five of which I was the victim of some form of retaliation or another on. And if I'm correct, two of those have yet to be completed or resolved by the OIG. And how many times have you been given a raise over the last seven years? I, I only get the annual COLA adjust adjustment that all federal employees get, sir, the cost of living. So you've had no other promotion? Um, maybe a mandatory step. You know, I'm a mandatory, steps. no. Correct. Yeah. Um, 
again, something that we, as a committee, both sides of the aisle, we got to look out for the people that are, are, are the whistleblowers here. And lastly, I just want to say to Mrs. Terry, God bless you and your family. As uh, Mr. Gowdy was pointing out, you know, there's some people that run to the call, they, they answer the call. Uh, I've been in those, uh, those hills and, and uh, not the exact spot where, where your son was, but that is tough duty. Whether in the light of day or the, the blackness, the darkness, uh, knowing that people are flowing north with nefarious intent to go out, oftentimes it's amazing. You, you go out as I have with the Border Patrol, most, most of the times they're, they're, these people are going out by themselves. Um, maybe going with two or three other people, maybe they're within radio shot, maybe not. Um, but doing a service for this country that they are not, in my opinion, adequately compensated for or thanked or understood. Um, but I can't thank uh, you and your family and loved ones, and I, we feel for your loss. And uh, we will continue to pursue this until we get to the bottom of it. And I hope that we can fully provide you all the answers that you deserve, um, and as we should. And uh, with that, I'll yield back, and now we're ready. Uh, yield to Mr. Lynch. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I know that uh, the majority has prepared a, a report that's been referred to several times today. Uh, and I, I just want to say a few things about it. Uh, uh, when you came into this position, Mr. Chairman, uh, you said that you would uh, do things differently uh, than in the past, that you'd try to work on a more bipartisan basis when you could. And for the most part, I have to say, as a longtime member of this committee, you have, you have done just that, and you should be commended for that. It's not an easy uh, task, as uh, the rest of uh, Congress can uh, testify to. Uh, for example, this committee conducted a very good bipartisan investigation of the Secret Service. And uh, we issued a wonderful report that was adopted by every single member of this committee. It was unanimous. It took time to get there. We had a lot of investigation, uh, a lot of hearings. Uh, but the final report had so much more authority uh, to the Secret Service and, and to, to the White House because it had credibility that, that came from Democrats and Republicans, and we all agreed on that. So when we received uh, this, this report uh, last night, uh, very late, uh, that's more than 250 pages, of course, we were disappointed because we never, never got a chance. It's, it's really an issue that we, as you can tell from the questioning today, we all support the Terry family. And so I, I know this investigation began with the previous chairman, so maybe the committee was just deferring to him on how to handle this process. But it's a shame because I think, I think the, ending rep the end report, if we had any in input at all, which we have not, this is solely uh, uh, the majority's report, Democratic uh, members who agreed with you were denied an opportunity to participate in this report. I think it would have <coughs> had more force, I think, on behalf of the Terry family, I think it would have had more force if, if we had been allowed to be part of that. And uh, so, so that, that's all I have to say on that, and that's just for, for future okay. reference. And that's, and it's not to your, your criticism at all. You've been, you've been wonderful on this, but uh, this is a little gap that occurred. The other thing is uh, we heard from uh, Senator Grassley earlier today that he intended to do a letter mm -hmm. uh, regarding the, the uh, obstruction of oversight. And, and I would just ask you if you, on behalf of uh, Ranking Member Cummings, if you would join us, uh, you know, pull this, this uh, House committee together, and perhaps we could do a similar letter uh, in support of the oversight. I think it would be helpful to uh, ATF Johnson, uh, Agent Johnson, and, uh, excuse me, Dodson, and, uh, and any others who might benefit yeah. from government oversight. And um, I think that's the spirit in which we're approaching this. I was just heard about this letter that uh, Senator Grassley is putting together. Uh, whether we, uh, in a bipartisan way, join on that letter or we do our own separate letter, uh, that's, uh, we'll, let, let's sort that out with the staff and, and members uh, here in the next day or two because okay. it should not go unanswered. I, I agree. agree with you there. Thank, thank you. Thank you. I, I well, now recognize the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Heiss, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, with all my colleagues here, thank each of you for being here. Um, and our hearts do go up. There's so many question marks in this whole thing. And um, uh, we thank you for coming. 
Special Agent Johnson, let me, let me go back to you. Um, and as the chairman was just saying, your testimony with how you've been uh, ostracized and outcast and all this kind of stuff is just inexcusable. You've explained even, in fact, what you just explained, even criminal charges, attempts for criminal charges. Were, were those charges related to the whistleblowing? Uh, they were partially yes, sir, and in retaliation for it. They uh, openly threatened to prosecute me with a violation of the grand jury 60 secrecy rule. They um, actually brought in an FFL in the Phoenix area and attempted to suborn perjury from him to indict me for witness tampering. They illegally transmitted classified material to me in an FBI skiff in Phoenix, which I had neither a, or I had clearance for, but I had no need to know in the hopes of prosecuting me for either its mishandling or its release. And they openly and very publicly uh, tried to or announced my, or announced a desire to have me prosecuted for uh, perjury for my original testimony here six years ago. And who is they? Well, sir, that's a good question. It's one of the ones that we could hope that this committee could ultimately answer one day. Uh, some of them were members of my former chain of command. Others were Department of Justice officials. Okay, I, I want to come back to that here in just a, a few moments. Um, are you aware of others besides yourself who suffered uh, for coming forward to blow the whistle? Yes, sir, many. And there are many that still suffer. Um, like I say, my story is, is just that. It's from me, but are there are other agents that have attempted to blow the whistle or bring forth you know, misconduct and mishandling by the agency, both my agency and other agencies, but they are, are still... Um, you know, in turmoil. They're still just getting chewed up in the gears of government, and it, it's this cultural aspect of it, this bureaucracy and the size of the entities that they are that keeps a lot of them from ever being heard, that prevents them from getting the, you know, opportunities like I have here. And this is one of the reasons that I don't take this lightly at all. This is, I, I can't tell you, we could fill this room and several more just like it with other people that have been through situations similar than I have, that have a story to tell. And it's just as important. And it's happening to them every day. And we don't take it lightly either. So you're, you would say that there's uh, obviously many people who for fear of the retaliation are not going to blow the whistle because they've seen what's happened to you and others. Would you agree with that? Yes, sir. And, and I can say I don't feel that anything, in any way how ATF or the Department of Justice handled me or my situation would give anyone the idea that whistleblowing is a favorable activity. Okay, so those who have been involved in whistleblower retaliation, are they still at the ATF? Yes, sir. There are a number of them. Okay, can you give us some names? I, could I provide that in another format, sir? Yes. Okay. Uh, do you know Bill Newell? Uh, yes, sir, he was my former special agent in charge. Do you know where he is today? Uh, my understanding, he is assigned to the Salt Lake City office. All right, so still with ATF. Has he received promotions? I, I cannot say, sir. Do you know Dave Voth? He was my former supervisor on the strike force in Phoenix, yes, sir. And where is he today? I believe he is in Minnesota. Hope McAllister? Yes, sir. She was the case agent involved in Fast and Furious. And where is she? Uh, she's still in Phoenix. Do you know that the ATF's professional review, review board recommended that Newell be fired and that both Voth and McAllister be disciplined? I, I had heard that, yes, sir. I don't know it firsthand, but I'm aware of that. Are you aware of any discipline? That obviously, Newell was not fired. He's still working. That's to my understanding, yes, sir. Uh, do you, do you, would you provide a list of others who are involved in this? I, I can, yes, sir. Mr. Chairman, I think it's, it's uh, a part of our responsibility to find out why Mr. Newell was not fired and if, whether or not there was any discipline uh, uh, directed towards Voth or McAllister, and if not, why not? I think these people and others that Special Agent Dodson will provide for us need to be held accountable to the full extent. And I would just ask, Mr. Chairman, that we follow uh, this as closely as we can and we see to it that justice is done and that um, those who are responsible for this are held accountable. I yield back.
Thank you, gentlemen. I'll now recognize myself uh, for five minutes for some questions. Um, and, and I'm going to cover a little different territory, um, Mr. Dotson, uh, Agent Dotson. Obviously, the goal was to trace these firearms once they were uh, entered into Mexico, and a number of them were recovered at crime scenes. Uh, were any of the firearms actually traced to a, to a crime scene? Y yes, sir. Several of the firearms, a number of which were, were recovered at crime scenes in Mexico and some on this side of the border. And you have to understand that the tracing aspect that you're referring to, the trace these firearms, that the definition of that is letting them be purchased or actually facilitating it, allowing it to happen and going home and waiting for the crime to occur where they're recovered and ultimately submitted back to the tracing system. What happened in the interim, we had no idea about. There was no full-time surveillance. There was nothing that rendered those weapons, you know, unfireable or, or non-operable. And, and, and I've pointed this out before, that one of the most striking things in all of this is we're only going to recover that weapon in the last crime that it's used in, all right? How many violent incidences occurred with you know, utilizing that firearm between the time it was purchased and the time it was ultimately recovered and traced, we have no measure of at all. Well, I asked that question because uh, there were two particularly egregious incidences where weapons traced back to Fast and Furious were used in, in crimes. One was in September 2nd, of 2009, in which 18 people were killed another, in Juarez, Mexico. And another one was uh, January 30th, 2010, uh, at a birthday party, about 60 teenagers. They killed 14, wounded I don't know how many, shot a lady down, a neighbor, and uh, a couple other young, young people. And uh, the weapons used there um, included weapons from Fast and Furious. Are you aware of that? Yes, sir, I am. And, and also, you, you, I'm aware of several other incidents where they were recovered. But what I think is important to point out is that DOJ and ATF have refused to provide the entirety of that information. These are the crimes, the atrocities that we know of. How many are there that we don't know of? that were recovered and a firearm was traced back to this program. That information has never been fully provided to this committee. That's murder and mayhem on a massive scale. It's on Agent a very Dodson. large scale, yes, sir. And, and obviously, Ms. Terry, we're here about Brian. Both of these crimes, these murders of these 32 people occurred before your son was murdered. And um, as far as I know, I wasn't in Congress at the time. I came in uh, 2015. I was elected in 2014. As far as I know, the committee, uh, unless somebody else has information uh, to, uh, about this, I don't think this committee knew about that. Um, and, and, and I'm going to take this a little bit farther. It just seems the height of hypocrisy, first of all, for the previous administration to uh, interfere with the investigation and the truth regarding uh, Border Patrol Agent Brian Terry and his family, and we owe that to you, but also to have been signatures to uh, a United Nations treaty banning the proliferation of, of small arms. And at the very time they were trying to push this through Congress, they were trafficking arms into Mexico. And um, uh, Agent Dodson, are you aware of any weapons uh, from Fast and Furious or, or uh, other ATF uh, operations that entered other countries besides Mexico? I, no, sir, I'm, I'm not for sure if other countries were involved, but I know that this strategy, as it was run out of the Phoenix office, was referred to as the Phoenix strategy, and it was being exported to all the field divisions along the southwest border. This was the the golden plan for how, and and Oh, this is what it boils down to, to combat illegal firearms trafficking by illegally trafficking firearms was the model that was going to be in place. So Fast and Furious was one case from one office in one field division. But what, what there were the, other operations being run out of other offices, though, weren't there? Yes, That sir. involved Colombia and Honduras and Venezuela? I, I cannot say for sure, but I've, I've heard things to that effect. Yes, sir. Um, do we have? Do we know if the weapon that was used uh, to murder uh, AFT agent Sammy Zapata was a, 
a, a weapon used that came through Fast and Furious. Yes, sir. That, that's been concluded that the firearm used in the murder of Agent Zapata was traced back to the Fast and Furious program. It's my understanding. As tragic as the death of Border Patrol agent Brian Terry is, the, uh, the deaths of so many other people, not citizens of the United States, as a result of having access to firearms provided by an agency of the United States, the fact that that's not bigger news, that that's not a, a scandal, is stunning. I, I think we owe it to the Terry family, but we also owe it to the American people to get to the bottom of this. Uh, with that, now I'll recognize the gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Russell, for uh, five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, Mrs. Terry, thank you for being here today. Uh, it's important that we always put a human face back on these issues, uh, and you not only uh, help uh, remind us of the honor of uh, Special Agent uh, Terry and his sacrifices, uh, but also our responsibility to make sure uh, that the honor of everyone else remains intact in this process and keep up the fight. Uh, there are a great many of us here that intend to keep it up with you, and so I, I thank you uh, for your presence here today. Agent Dodson, you, you had mentioned in, in the uh, comments and questions uh, from Representative Gowdy that the strategy made no sense, and I, and I would certainly agree with that. Um, that as a former uh, drug enforcement officer, you would never walk drugs. Uh, we would never see a, a situation where firearms would walk. And, and as uh, the chairman has alluded to uh, and even stated, you know, what would be behind this and, and what were the causes of it? My instincts tell me that much like planting a gun at a crime scene, to try to affect an outcome that really isn't the real story. Uh, the administration at the time seemed set on planning an idea that firearms from the United States and their seemingly unregulated flow and ease of purchase were posing a danger uh, to the drug war and border security as a whole. This in turn would set conditions to manipulate public opinion to restrict firearms ownership, and their purchase by American citizens. I think that's the real story that unfortunately so many have been caught up in uh, to include you, your service, uh, Agent uh, Terry, Agent Zapata, others uh, that were caught up in this, uh, not to mention Mex Mexican citizens and children that were gunned down. Um, that's the egregious thing. That's why there is so much uh, protection of this even to this day that the United States of America would try to manipulate through walking of guns and planting in essence a gun at a crime scene to go after something else um, and I, I understand your uh, your difficulty in it and in fact you strike me as uh, not only a very dutiful man but a humble man and you're, you're not here to finger point and I appreciate that uh, having served over two decades in uniform myself, I, I understand that. But you have an opportunity also to help us get at who should be held accountable. The honor of Agent Terry is intact. Nothing will ever change that. But the honor of the family and by extension of the ATF and its reputation as a whole is not intact because the family's not being treated as the victims that, that you clearly are. And at the same time, uh, the ATF comes under continued suspicion. With good accounting, then, you know, all the way back to the first decade in the 1800s uh, when we decided to do oversight, this is exactly the type of thing that American citizens expect that we do. And so in your, in your view, are there people clearly accountable for these actions? You don't have to name them here, but are there people clearly accountable that you could name that would help us restore that honor, not only to the agency, but to American citizens and their government? 
to answer your question, sir, yes, there are some individuals that I feel are clearly accountable for both the, um, the flawed and dangerous strategy known as Fast and Furious, as well as the attempts by the United States government to cover it up, as well as for direct acts of reprisal and retaliation against me. However, given my position on this totem pole of leadership being you know, at the subterranean level, that knowledge of mine only goes so far. Um, it is incumbent upon this committee and its members to be able to ferret out that information from those echelons above John Dodson who at those levels are responsible and needs to bear that burden and those responsibilities. Um, again, my, my spectrum of knowledge in this is only to a certain level. And, and I get that, I, I do. Uh, but I also know having been a uh, you know, former commander in a different life, that sometimes a soldier going to an IG uh, can open up a whole basket of things. <laughs> and, and we've seen an opportunity uh, for that here where we've seen a Justice Department that clearly lied, put out a letter that they knew to be false uh, for reasons that are still as yet to be determined. But as I, again, I stated what my own instincts are on it and why those decisions were made seemingly very coincidentally timely with the expiration of the 10-year ban on so-called assault firearms. Uh, lots of coincidences there. Um, but if, if you would work with us to help us, as uh, Representative Heiss had also asked, we need that help. We have to be able to continue to dig. And maybe it is that the people uh, that, that were able to query and were able to ask, it turns out that that they're able to help us even further. It may not be them at all, but it could lead to other things. We have to get to the bottom of this. And, and Agent Heyer, would you, would you care to speak al uh, along this line also? Congressman, your, in, your uh, intuition is right on. Um, you know, this entire operation, as it was conceived, uh, was counterintuitive to what we, my 26 years in law enforcement, and uh, what agents like John have dedicated their lives to. It was a total disregard for public safety. Uh, it continues, the weapons of this uh, operation continue to, to present a clear and present danger to law enforcement on both sides of the border. You know, we even saw uh, through emails obtained by this uh, committee, um, ATF agents, supervisors in the Phoenix Field Division celebrating uh, when weapons from the operation were found at crime scenes in Mexico. Uh, insane. Absolutely insane. You know, the, uh, you, you asked earlier about those uh, truly responsible, who they, these individuals are. I think that uh, uh, the OIG's investigation into Operation Fast and Furious, along with uh, the previous two reports uh, written by this committee, uh, indicate exactly who those individuals are. The fact of the matter was, is, no one was held accountable. And that's the true pain and the, the truly egregious part of all this. Uh, those DOJ officials uh, in the prior administration have moved on. Uh, they are now in high paying jobs in the private sector. Um, the, uh, the U.S. attorney in Arizona has moved on without ever being held accountable. Those senior ATF uh, officials in headquarters were allowed to retire and move on without being held accountable. And just as you learned, the, uh, the agents on the ground level responsible for Operation Fast and Furious were allowed to take downgrades and move to their hometowns and move to other parts of the country. And the case agent was allowed to remain right in Tucson and continue in her job uh, while the whistleblowers continue not to look at being considered for promotion and, and get on with their lives. So that continues to be uh, a truly egregious behavior, a part of ATF, and, and upon DOJ as a whole in the aftermath of Brian Terry's death. Well, and I thank you for that, and thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. And, and while Agent Terry and Agent Zapata and others, uh, their honor is certainly intact, 
One thing we can do is to make sure that those that were not held accountable, that their honor will go down in history tainted because it deserves to be so and because of the sacrifices made by honorable agents such as Agent Dodson, yourself, uh, Agent Zapata, and Agent Terry. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Just to clarify, and, and um, Agent Dodson, I really appreciate your testimony, I, I, but I want to clarify that we're grateful for the recent uh, Department of Justice and OIG report, um, which in February released its conclusions that the firearms recovered at the scene of, of uh, Jamie Zapata's murder, and by the way, he was uh, an Immigration Customs Enforcement agent, uh, were purchased by individuals that ATF and the DEA should have been investigating and confronting, and it had similarities to Fast and Furious, but uh, they were not ultimately connected to Fast and Furious. But with that, again, I want to thank you for your testimony and, and the work that you've done, and uh, and you have served with honor, and, and you, you're, what you're doing right now, again, uh, uh, indicates that. With that, uh, I'll recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Desaunier. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, first, obviously, to Mrs. Terry and Agent Hare, um, it's, it's nothing any of us can say, really, to, but to offer our continued respect and condolences for your loss and your efforts to make sure that that loss leads to something better and make sure that another family will never have to go through that. Um, after a year-long investigation by uh, Ranking Member Cummings, issued, we issued a staff report in 2012 that found that ATF's misguided gun walking operations originated in 2006 as a strategy at ATF's Phoenix Field Division. The report stated, and I quote, although these officials claimed that they had no probable cause to arrest any straw purchasers at the time, allowing hundreds of illegally purchased military-grade assault weapons to fall into the hands of violent drug cartels over the course of five years and created an obvious and inexcusable threat to public safety on both sides of the border, uh, we now know that the IG has said we've fulfilled or the department has fulfilled its recommendations. But following on the questions uh, from my friend from Oklahoma and your comments, Ancient Air, and starting with you, uh, Mr. Dodson, we get to a larger, I think, endemic problem, maybe culturally uh, and within these institutions where even Congress having these multiple hearings, um, there seems to be, and Agent Hare, you sort of hit at this, is that uh, there, part of the culture is that, well, we'll just endure this and there won't be repercussions. So the, the real question is, do you think we've done enough to change the culture so this won't happen again? Congressman, I, I'd say this uh, goes beyond culture. It's, it's doing what's right. It's being honest. We're sworn as, as federal agents. I took the oath. You as, as a congressman have taken the oath. Part of that oath is, is to do the right thing. And there are so many examples of officials in ATF, the Department of Justice, and uh, U.S. Attorney's Office that were involved in Operation Fast and Furious that did not do the right thing, especially after Brian Terry's murder. Uh, that's the egregious part. And uh, it goes beyond culture. It, it's basic integrity, and that's what was lacking by so many. So that brings up the obvious concern is, even if we continue to have these hearings, in future Congresses have these hearings, um, the problem may go away for a while, but if we haven't got at that, the culture of honesty, uh, for lack of a better expression, and I, I don't... This is not just for ATF. We certainly have it in our political culture. I always think of President Lincoln saying that he had to do what he did because that oath he took was registered in heaven. And in those days, there seemed to be, even with all their problems and civil war, there seemed to be some connection by a principal group of people within this institution and others that we would adhere to that um, honesty level. So the question really is, have we gotten to that where there's enough people who believe in the honesty within ATF that this will not happen again? Sir, I, I, I wish that I could tell you that 
it will never happen again, or I even think that it's at a point where it won't happen again. Nobody would have liked to come here today and tell you uh, more than I that in the past six years since the last time I was here, things have been great. I've seen a, a huge change and uh, they're really you know, working hard to fix the problem. I unfortunately can't tell you that. And I think that even though this body, all that it has done up until this point, that the culture that is still there, it still remains. And there's, there's two prongs to this problem. One of those are those people who um, actually took overt acts to try and cover stuff up, to try and retaliate, or to try and, and spearhead this kind of operation. There are those people with those malice of intent. Um, then behind them, and, and where they're able to operate and get things done, is within the culture and the bureaucracy. Now, those people that did those overt acts that actively you know, perpetrated those things may be gone. Um, some of them I know are, others I'm not so confident of. But um, the culture is still there. It's still right to do it again. I believe, and until there is genuine change in that, in how we function as a government and hold uh, each other accountable, and we are held accountable to the people of this country that there will be another Fast and Furious. Mm -hmm. It will only be under another name. It will happen with another agency, and it may involve another commodity. But as long as this bureaucracy, those wheels are allowed to turn and grind through everyone the way that they do, um, even with all, all that you've done and all your efforts, I, I don't think you've, you've put a dent in it. And I think therein lies the problem, unless there are consequences in any field, um, the generations that come behind them, even though the rules have changed, don't see that there are consequences for bad behavior. And that's just human nature. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll yield back. Thank the gentleman. The chair recognizes the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Walker, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Terry, it's a privilege to get a chance to meet you in person today. Uh, you are, uh, you know, it's not just Brian as much as a hero that it, he was and is. You, and that goes for Kelly, your daughter as well. Uh, you've been living miles apart. I can only imagine the expense, the toil that, that has been on your family. Uh, but you've kept his flame burning bright. It's flickered a few times, but I think it is as glowing as bright as it's ever been. Thank you and Mr. Heyer and all of those who have just bulldogged this thing where you refuse, Special Agent Dodson as well, that you refuse to allow injustice to continue to permeate uh, even in the halls of this government. And so I'm grateful for that. I appreciate that. I'm, I'm saddened that the former administration, President Obama included, would work so hard with executive privilege to keep many of these documents sealed, whether it was either for the incompetence of the Department of Justice, who did not even think about or, or refused to allow our Mexican counterparts in law enforcement know that we are providing automatic weapons and such to drug cartels, uh, would be something that most of us would look at as far as a common sense standpoint. Um, I just feel like that the previous Department of Justice uh, owes more to the American people, but specifically to the Terry family and these many other families who have gone through such tragic loss. But it goes without saying that what you are doing uh, continues to celebrate uh, the life of your son. And I think that you are, are willing, you and your family, to carry what it sometimes I can only imagine is, is quite a heavy load. I've got a couple questions, just real short. I probably won't even use the, the full component of my time. But uh, Special Agent Dotson, uh, is there anything Congress can do to help whistleblowers come forward to expose failings like Fast and Furious? If, if you could say, here's one or two things that I would recommend having gone through this journey, here's what Congress could do to help. Uh, sir, uh, there's, I think there's a lot that could be done, but it's going to be a, a, like a pretty long and, and, and hard road. It's, but you guys are already doing a lot. I want you to understand that. Please don't take anything I say away from that. The fact that people know that there are bodies, there are committees like this, with staffers like you guys have here, that, you know, Tristan and Castor, that I know personally, and I'm sure there are others. But as long as they know that there is a place where they can come, where people do care, where they have a voice, you know, in, in, in this government, and they can, there are avenues in place and things, certain protections that can be afforded to them, that's already huge. Now, what you can do to, to make it better and make it ex more expanded and to get more people to come in, uh, I don't know. I mean, sure. it's, 
it's all part of the mission, I guess, is how do you get the word to these people? Right. And I, I help you do that. I tell people that I talk to or those people have contacted me both officially and unofficially and asked for my experience. And, and what I've gone through, I, there's two things that I want through what I went through to help the Terries get the answers that they deserve and to help other whistleblowers that find themselves in a situation sure. like I did in the future. Okay, can I ask you a personal question? Yes, uh, do you regret coming forward? Do I regret? No, sir. It's like I don't. I don't regret coming forward at all. I, I just did my job. I did what I thought I was supposed to do, what was expected of me. How do you have a regret for that? Sure, well then let me follow up with this question. If there's anything that you could do differently, and looking back, if you started this process from the beginning, what would you do differently? Well, sir, given the, the given what I know now and the current, current political climate, I would maybe look for a way to blame it on the Russians because that would guarantee <laughs> bipartisan and it would get the major news media looking into it and asking the hard questions. Mm -hmm. But absent of that, um, I would say, look, I didn't do everything right. I made some mistakes. I made some decisions out of fear and anger because there were times that I was very scared and times that I was very upset. Um, some of those things I would do differently, but because I was fortunate enough to, to land somehow with uh, Senator Grassley's staffers at that time, and ultimately over here in the committee, um, they they guided me and helped me, and they, it was they, I mean it was immeasurable. I can never thank them enough. Sure. For, for everything. Not to any scale that which you have done, but there was a time in my life where I told the truth, and it cost me something. Uh, not to what it's cost you, but I just want to encourage you today that when you do the right thing, it may take a while, may even take a few years. But when you do the right thing, eventually uh, it's honored. So thank you again for your willing to be able to carry this load again to Mr. Heyer, uh, Ms. Terry, Kelly. Thank you all for being here. It's a privilege to get a chance to be in a hearing with you folks. So with that, I yield back. Thank the gentleman. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Connerly, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And let me uh, extend the, my welcome and ongoing condolences to the Terry family and Mrs. Terry in particular and Mr. Hire representing the family. Um, it is a terrible thing when we lose somebody in the service of their country and on a bipartisan basis we very much understand, I think, and appreciate your loss as best we can. I do want to say, Mr. Chairman, that if there's one thing in terms of process that ought to unite us it is in opposition to this uh, vowed policy coming out of the Trump White House that uh, they will respond to oversight requests only if they are signed by a Republican member and in some cases chairman of the subcommittee or the full committee. Uh, had President Obama had that policy, <coughs> uh, we'd still be hearing about it. <coughs> um, and I will say this. If that policy is allowed to stand, it invites a, a similar policy when tables are turned. And that's not the, good for the- The gentleman will yield. Of course. Uh, there was a colloquy between Chairman Chavitz and Ranking Member Lynch in which uh, we're in agreement, sir. Yep. I, I yield back. I, I, th thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I did uh, hear that colloquy and I also heard Senator Grassley uh, express his disapproval as well and I commend that. Uh, I just want to get on the record, though, what I think are the profound consequences if that policy is not quickly overturned. I thank the gentleman. I think there's a discussion about a letter uh, from the committee as well. Great. And I pray it will be bipartisan because however conservative, however liberal, however middle of the road any of us may be, all of us institutionally have a stake in that. And that's just a mistake. I, I hope, I want to believe it's by a rookie White House that doesn't fully understand how the legislative branch functions and constitutionally has a function. I think the gentleman's points are valid and very important and uh, appreciate him making that for the record. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Dodson, do you consider yourself a whistleblower? Um, I use that term to describe myself sometimes and what I did only because I lack a, another term to describe it. I, like I say, I consider what I did just my job, sir. I did what I thought was expected of me, what I thought my oath you know, or made me do, and, and what my duty was. Did you feel any pattern of retaliation based on what you did? 
Yes, sir. And was that retaliation limited to the office in Phoenix or elsewhere? No, sir. It was not limited to the office of Phoenix. And at times uh, it felt, and I believe it came from the highest levels of the Department of Justice. And uh, unfortunately, we don't have anyone from the Department of Justice here today. It would be interesting to hear from them. There, there are several of them that I would like to talk to yeah. myself, sir, yes. Yeah, I, I can only imagine. So how did you find yourself protected? Uh, let's, let's, if you don't mind, let's call you for a minute a whistleblower. Yes, sir. Uh, for the purposes, because our committee cares a lot about whistleblowers. Again, on a bipartisan basis, we care a lot about whistleblower protection legislation. And so we, we want to learn from your experience, which I think is terribly instructive here. How did you manage to withstand that retaliation and remain a special agent with ATF? Um, well, sir, they, it was partially because of the air cover that I got from Senator Grassley and his staff, as well as from the committee staff and the committee itself. But you learn pretty quickly that that can only go so far. Those letters that can be fired off to DOJ or to your agency, although they can bring attention to it and put things on notice, when the, you know, in, the, in the works of it, it's, it's, there's not a lot of teeth there. Um, and you think, I always thought before this, you hear talk of people who have <coughs> blown the whistle and they have a whistleblower card. And you're taught that those people are untouchable, you know, that their agency can't do anything to them, they can essentially do whatever they want and they can't be fired. It's not until you find yourself in that situation and you realize that that card doesn't make you untouchable, it makes you unapproachable. And it's those things that the agency and the department have done. Like I say, the, all the overt things, the ways that they tried to come after me, tried to prosecute me, trying to smear me, to you know, everything that they've said, the lies they've told about me, the internal affairs investigations, those things are tangible. Those are things that you can combat, you can overcome. It's that alienation, that ostracization that you can't. When people simply won't talk to you, won't work with you, won't deal with you, you cannot make them. You can't force that issue, and you're on your own. Yeah, and I, and I think one of the things implied in what you just said, too, is you had the intestinal fortitude to stand up to that and, and fight back. Not everybody has that kind of stamina or constitutional makeup, and, uh, and, and so they can become victims of that kind of retaliation, even though they were trying to do the right thing. And uh, I think we'd welcome your reflections on, you, you had the protection of a member of Congress, and that's good. <clears throat> but that's not going to be available to everybody in various and sundry circumstances. So the question is, how can we create a legislative framework that protects people who want to do the right thing, even if it's unpopular within their agency or division? My time is up, and I thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, gentlemen. Uh, the chair now recognizes the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Grothman, for five minutes. Yeah, we really haven't gotten into a lot how this happened in the first place or what the motive would be for the U.S. government uh, to try to get United States automatic weapons in the hands of Mexican drug cartels. And it's very horrible what happened to Brian Terry, I would suppose, given the zeal with which they were pursuing this, I suppose there are a variety of uh, Mexican individuals who wound up, unknown Mexican individuals who wound up being killed today as the result of the actions of the United States government. Do you think that's accurate, say, Mr. Heyer? I think that's a fair assumption. Yeah, has the Obama administration or anybody connected with the administration apologized to the Mexican government for trying to get automatic weapons down to the Mexican drug cartels, as far as you're aware? Not that I'm aware of. Oh, my goodness. Well, somebody ought to apologize to them. Um, do you know, because you've, you've followed this as much as anybody, Mr. Heyer, what, what would be the motivation uh, to try to get American automatic weapons in the hands of drug cartels? Why, why was it in the... In the, in the why did some people in the American government think it was in our interest to make sure the Mexican drug cartels were armed to the teeth? Well, as I understand it, uh, there were different uh, ideas. From the Phoenix Field Division, their goal, as I understand it, were to ultimately be able to take down a Mexican drug cartel, the leadership of the cartel. How that was supposed to Happen? I really don't know. Uh, all we knew was the first part. They were going to let weapons walk, 
to straw buyers working for the cartel. In the bigger picture, uh, with respect to the previous administration, I don't know. Uh, was it to build some sort of uh, apprehension to automatic weapons? To uh, strengthen you, gun laws? I, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, people out there throw around the idea that the hatred of the Second Amendment was so great in the prior administration that they wanted, you know, people killed with a, uh, or people, uh, they wanted to look like we had a crisis of automatic weapons here in the United States. Um, now, Eric Holder certainly was not very helpful to this group. Um, we, we held them contempt in Congress. Could you, could you just in general give us your opinion of the degree to which Eric Holder tried to help this in, uh, investigation and the degree to which he tried to stand in the way of finding out what was really going on here? Well, I spoke early about our frustration in every aspect in dealing with the Department of Justice, and uh, that continued not only with uh, Eric Holder, but his predecessor. Um, letters went unanswered, requests for information went unanswered, and again... So it appears combative. that he really didn't want to get to the bottom. He was willing to cover up. Well, when it came to the Terry family, I believe they saw us as a nuisance. Okay. Okay. Um, I mean, if, you know, I, I would think most people, if they were president, you know, then they would they would get involved and say, "Hey, I got a real you know a real problem here." Did you see the Obama administration step up and do anything about this? Again, nothing. You know, we were really felt like we were on our own, and uh, with the exception of this committee and the really really providing the only information beyond what journalists were were providing. Uh, okay. That was our sole source of accurate information uh, with regard to Brian's death and the circumstances around his death. Okay, now we should see what happened to Eric Holder here. I was just kind of Googling him, and maybe you know what's going on. It, it looks like after he left public service, he was rewarded by working at Covington and Burling, a, a very you know top of the line. I don't know what his compensation is there a top-of-the-line kind of liberal-leaning law firm here in Washington. Does that bother you when you see people like Special Agent Dodson, his career kind of stalls because he cares about the people and cares about the future of this country, but somebody who, you know, gets in the way of this investigation, uh, such a big problem, is rewarded by the left-leaning establishment here in town by getting a job with a big law firm? Well, it's not only just the rewards, it was the lack of accountability. And I spoke earlier today about uh, the numerous officials that were allowed to leave their positions within uh, top DOJ uh, positions that were able to leave and move into the private sector just like uh, Lanny Brewer, just like uh, Eric Holder. Uh, it was the lack of, of holding individuals accountable, like those senior ATF headquartered individuals that were allowed to retire with full pensions. Okay, just one other thing, and I know I'm a little bit over, older. I just hope this committee and whoever the new committee chairman is um, does what they can to make sure this is written in the history books. You know, sometimes, you know, they say the winners write the history books, and sometimes horrific things happen, and they just disappear into the ether, and future generations will never know about it. I mean, to me, the Fast and Furious scandal, this should be something, you know, actually worse, worse than Teapot Dome. I mean, you know, this should be one of the greatest scandals in American history. And I hope this committee does all they can so that people in the future always know the name of Eric Holder and know how little was done by this administration after they participated for whatever motivation in trying to get automatic weapons in the hands of the drug cartels. I'd like to thank you, Mrs. Terry, for showing up. I'd like to thank you, Special Agent Dodson. I mean, I, you know, um, I know you're, I'm sure, financially not as well off as you'd be if you had just, you know, kept your head down and shut up and da 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 da. But of course, I'm sure your reward is greater because, you know, you're on the side of the angels as opposed to a lot of those other people who are just grabbing the cash. Thanks so much. I thank the gentleman. I would like to thank our witnesses for taking time to appear for us before us today, and particularly you, 
all three of you were here six years ago, Ms. Terry, um, your strength and stamina and your commitment to your son's memory and seeking justice for him is uh, inspiring. Uh, we continue to grieve with you, but at the same time, I, I want you to know that we deeply appreciate the service of Brian Terry and, and how you've honored that service and, and, and in holding this hearing, I hope some, at some point that, that you will feel like he's been honored by the United States government. Mr. Heyer, appreciate your coming again, and, and Mr. Dotson, Agent Dotson, um, for your testimony and your, your diligence. And, uh, and, and trying to, to shed light on some problems that, that should have been resolved, frankly, uh, years ago. Uh, if there are no further business without objection, the committee stands adjourned.